Hey guys, it's Morgan, and I am so excited that we are entering episode number three of the Freedom Records. This one's pretty special to me because it's with Gabby Franco, someone that I first interviewed in a very short, short length interview um, back when I first started the nonprofit. And I went to Dallas to interview her. I later moved to Texas because I enjoyed it so much when I first experienced it. Um, and it was just really exciting to be able to bring her onto our official set for the Freedom Records and get a long form interview done with her. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Gabby, she was on Top Shot. She is just so cool because she's from Venezuela and served as a member of the Venezuelan Olympic shooting team went to the Olympics and later escaped socialism in Venezuela as it came to power and came to America and now speaks out about it. So the interesting thing with me that always catches my attention when I'm talking to Gabby is the fact that when she was in Venezuela, Chavez was coming to power and he's calling himself a democratic socialist, a progressive, using all of these usual words. And he was actually democratically elected into office. Now, that's the thing. Socialists can come to power in many ways. It's about implementing certain policies. It's, that's what really destroys the economy and then the country. And so Hugo Chavez was democratically elected and he had all the feel good talking points. And some, some people in the country were getting a little concerned because his talking points sounded very similar to a fellow next door called Fidel Castro. And so one of the people close to Gabby in her life had actually escaped Castro in Cuba. And he tried to warn the people around him, listen, what Hugo Chavez is saying right now is exactly what Castro promised us as well. And now look at Cuba. Look at how bad it is there. Look at the devastation. Look at the dictatorship that they live under. Well, nobody really listened. And it turns out everybody's response was something along the lines of, well, it could never happen here. We're so rich with our resources in this country. We're not an island like Cuba. We have elections, X, Y, Z. They had a million different excuses. And so Gabby was actually one of the only people that took his concerns and his warnings seriously. And she decided to leave the country. And it was a very serious and hard decision for her. But it's a good thing she did. Now, her major lesson for us is the fact that she took the concern seriously back then while everyone was saying, oh, it could never happen here. We're not like Cuba. We're different. But now that's exactly what Americans say. They say, we're not like Venezuela. It'll never happen in America. And Gabby is in America now saying, I can't believe that I am saying exactly what my friends from Cuba told me. What a powerful message. You guys, I hope you've been enjoying the Freedom Records. I hope you learned so much from Gabby and her story. And I hope you share this with your friends so that they can learn too. Thank you so much for watching and supporting our organization. I am Gaby Franco. I was born and raised in Venezuela. I'm an Olympian, competitive shooter. I'm an author and your firearms instructor. Truth is, Venezuela was not that bad before Hugo Chavez. Here in the United States, things are different for me because now I do have a voice. Now I can vote and I can do something about this. Let's get right into it. Sure. Um, the problem is I know a lot about you. The people watching probably don't know much. And so let's just start with the basics. Can you uh, explain what you do right now so that we can get some context and then we'll go back to where you came right. from? So I am a farms instructor. I am a competitive shooter. I shoot what it's something called USPSA. Uh, it's a fun uh, shooting discipline that involves uh, running, shooting, and a lot of different techniques. Uh, I'm also an author. Um, I'm sponsored for what I do. And I, in so many ways, I love to do uh, speaking about the dangers of socialism, communism, and how people can get there. I'm also a full-time college student. I am full, about to graduate this year, so that's a big, big 
you know. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and, you know, I'm always looking forward to doing things, looking forward to the future, looking forward to every day, what I can I do, things to get better. So Yeah, I mean, before we started filming and you were telling me your your plan for your path after this degree, I, it inspired me because I'm like, oh, wait, I have to start <laughs> thinking bigger too. Um, that's awesome. Let's, let's start going back now because your story starts many decades ago, I would say, before you were even born because the history of Venezuela is quite complicated. It is. Um, can you explain how <clears throat> your family experienced the rise of socialism in Venezuela? And what I really like about your story is that you got to see Venezuela before Chavez. Yeah. Um, so can we hear a little bit about that and what your family experienced personally? Well, I lived, I was raised in a time where difficult the 80s and 90s in Venezuela. There was actually the, a lot of turmoil happening. Uh, we had a lot of inflation. Uh, but Venezuela was not always like that. In the 60s, the 70s was the golden area of Venezuela mm -hmm. where oil prices were super high. Uh, I mean, considering the circumstances back then, but uh, it was a boom. And uh, Venezuela, the government became this paternalistic uh, government. And mm -hmm. that kind of created that idea that the government was there to protect you, to do everything for you. So when obviously time went by, uh, corruption and there was not, uh, the government, I mean, those corrupt individuals didn't know how to manage the Venezuelan's wealth the best way for the people and became the crisis. So I grew up in that time and it was very difficult, you know, for everybody, uh, especially for us, for the youth that we were trying to get out there and have a dream of things, but at the same time, you see how your parents struggled with the inflation, uh, struggle with the new laws that were implemented. And so even, even before Hugo Chavez, things were, in my eyes, as a kid, they were fine. Mm -hmm. You see, perhaps yeah. a little bit different to the adults who were working and working very hard. But to me, um, I still have my childhood. Uh, we still had, you know, schools. We could go to school. We can go to the grocery store even if we, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I don't come from a wealthy family at all. But you know, you could save money, you could buy your car. So some, even sometimes I come parents in, in, a, in a different perspective, my life now with my son, or what I can provide my son with my life back then in Venezuela, with some differences, of course. You know, my mom, where there were times she would say, right now we cannot buy that ice cream or that toy. Mm -hmm. And we understood. You see, but they were there available. By the time that my parents could, they could buy it. So there's not much difference now that I can tell myself, well, no, you are not behaving very good. You're not gonna get that toy. <laughs> it's a different perspective, but at the same time, it was available. It, it, things were available back then. Um, I was an athlete. Uh, I was able to travel and compete for Venezuela, which was a, you know, a very huge honor to represent Venezuelans, to represent my, my home country back then. And, and having that view of the future, per se, as a, as, a, as a young person, even with the small struggles that we could see, that we could perceive. Mm, and so where were you traveling? Where were you competing? Oh, well, I competed in Olympic shooting. I went to Peru. It's casual. I love how you just didn't include that in the initial <laughs> yes, thing. I, I competed on behalf of my country. Yes, at the <laughs> Olympics. So you're an Olympic athlete. And, yes. and so you felt that pride that, you know, you, your country had problems, but did you feel like we're going to get through this? Or did you not really just know much about the politics at the time? So you didn't really know what was going on? Or what were your thoughts on that? Well, I did have some friends, Cuban friends, mm -hmm. that uh, were constantly, they were very close friends and they were always sitting that you know that thought that oh Hugo Chavez even before he got elected that man talks like Fidel Castro uh, Hugo Chavez speaks in ways that is or promise uh, these ideas that are not sustainable that they're going to give all this to the people that they are going to uh, you know have this power so they can do more and I remember listening to these friends 
And, and because they were so, I saw them all the time, almost every day, they were training with us. Um, there was a time that I was like, I understand what you're saying, but I still cannot envision it, you know? Like when somebody tells you, yeah, it could happen that like in your country, you won't be able to find food in the grocery store. If somebody, if I tell that to an American, they'll be like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> the government will never let that happen. Venezuela was on the, in the, in the bridge to, you know, we had the largest oil reserve in the world. We were so rich. And there's a saying in Venezuela that we say, we were rich and we didn't know it. Oh, wow. We just didn't know it. And so his words always were in the back of my head until as we continued training, I realized that it was more difficult for us to train as a, in the farms industry. Now we couldn't find 22 ammunition. Now we couldn't find pellets. And we're talking about pellets and 22 ammunition. Then come these ideas of um, banning firearms or having more control. And this ideology came like many gun control ideologies come with this belief that that's how they can combat crime. Wow. Once we take the guns, crime is gonna, you know, it's gonna go down because that's a problem, right? And you would see in the news and the, and the advertisements on the TV, these personalities, actors, actresses, vowing and talking about gun control, like this is it, we have to do it. Wow. So okay. I'm, my heart hurts hearing all this stuff. I, so they had the celebrities, the people that were looked up to. Oh, yeah. Just like in America. Today. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's actually, you can find it on YouTube. I can send you a video. Please do. We'll put yes. it in this. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're still on YouTube. That You can see them talking about wow. personalities, about gun control, how gun control is good, that, you know, you people should uh, be give away their firearms. Because in Venezuela, we didn't have a right like we have here, like at the Second Amendment, but it was... A privilege. People were allowed to do that. People were allowed to have farms. People were allowed to go hunting, uh, even self-defense to have a concealed and carry license. That was, uh, you know, allowed okay. back then. And would you have concealed carry? I was too young. Okay. So I wasn't. I never got to that point. Yeah, but it was a normal thing for people to I have firearms. Say, I don't know exactly if it was a normal, like normal thing, mm -hmm. but it was available. Okay. So what the government does, or what they did they started creating like a chokehold on uh, gun ranges, gun shops, especially. Uh, they banned the importation of certain firearms, uh, most of them. And so everything got concentrated into the government. So now citizens couldn't do it through gun shops. They have to go through the government. Oh, wow. And so, of course, when you go through the government, now you have bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Now you have that, for instance, back then, if you lived in the city, you have your gun shop right there and the process, they will deal with everything else. But now you have to go where? Car Caracas? It's like somebody from Texas now have to go to DC and deal for a concealed carry license, to give you an yeah. example. And would you buy the gun from the government? They became the provider? Um, or it was just this new process it that was you a had whole to get new approval process. on okay. And obviously, um, the government, what they wanted to do, basically, was having to understand, well, understand, no. Wanted to know who has what, and they wanted to have that control. Even in Venezuela, there was sort of a registration of firearms. Um, it was different when that registration is owned or is I on see. the hands of gun shops now, it's the government who has it. Yeah, so it's about control. Now, did crime go down oh, after the gun no, control was implemented, not. like the celebrities promised, or what happened after guns were taken away by socialists? Well, one of the things that people don't realize, and I think the society, because they 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 paint this idea that guns are the one are the issue, mm -hmm. right? But the problem is they don't they don't tell the people or people don't realize, I should say, because it's not, that's, that's the thing. It's not the job necessarily the government to fully educate people. People need to learn and find the education for themselves as well. There's Wouldn't a point, that be nice? <laughs> it, there's a point that you're an adult and you can say, okay, mm -hmm. I, I can do my own research. 
right? Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, that doesn't happen in, not even sometimes in the United States. No. I, w- I, th- I think complacency and ignorance are, are core problems with every political issue. And I would argue it's more, it's not like people are ignorant here. Mm-mm. I think it's, it's, it comes down to we get too busy. People get to BC and they rely on someone else to do the analogy, to tell them and what that means, yeah. what this law means to you. And then at the end of the day, you're like, oh, that sounds plausible. And they follow it and then they realize how bad that is. Yeah, and that's actually a good point. I, so an example, I was baking in my kitchen during mm-hmm. the State of the Union and people were like, ugh. Why would you even watch that? Mm -hmm. I can't stomach it. And I'm like, well, because I want to hear the direct speech. I don't want to hear someone's opinion on it. I want to hear someone's, I want to hear what he actually said and then have my own opinions on it and go away with, with my own thoughts. But people these days don't even want to take the time to maybe as they're cooking dinner that night, play it in the background just so that they can be more aware of what's happening in the country. Yeah, because, you know, even in Venezuela for a long, I guess as a young person, I thought Mm -hmm. only poor people brought or put Hugo Chavez in power because of their own ignorance. And that was not the case. Mm. There were people, educated people, who put Hugo Chavez in power. There were people who thought that Hugo Chavez was indeed going to do this drastic change, and sure he did, Mm -hmm. but to the worst. Now, can we talk a little bit about, I know you were younger at this time, did you hear from your family or anything, or did you, do you remember the campaign slogans or the language he was using? Because it's very similar to what we hear these days of this democratic socialism of progress. Do you remember anything specific? Not necessarily specific. I yeah. mean, that's something we can look it up yeah. everywhere online. But what I know, the spirit of what people thought, he, Hugo Chavez, created to me the, the worst thing that anyone can create is the hate between classes. Mm. Okay, it was like a complete alienation of the haves and the no-haves. And yeah, there were a lot of people who were uh, poor that were struggling a lot. Uh, some families were just trying, like us, were trying to push you know, forward. Uh, but that distinction was never made. It was no such thing as, hey, let's move all of us, go up. No, it was just the hate. It's the, they are putting you down. And that's one of the reasons he expropriated those businesses. You know, these ideas that now I'm going to take from them and give them to you because that is for you. And basically that was the beginning to, you know, what what is followed all these years. So Hugo Chavez created hate. He created this idea that he was going to be the Messiah, the true Messiah, because Venezuela you know, from the 60s, the 70s, like I said, the beginning was the golden era. We had so much, the economy was so, was thriving that the government covered ever, everything, education, health, uh, infrastructure. But there was no, never created this uh, responsibility from the citizens that, yeah, we have to pay taxes. We have to, you know, create all these things. So the government became a paternalistic you know, umbrella that was supposed to cover everything as if oil was going to be or oil prices and economy was going to be the same forever. Of course, with that, we have corruption, of course. So he then came saying, I am going to give you the true socialism. I'm going to give you the, what the government is supposed to give you. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to take from the rich. I'm going to give it to you. Wow. So it is all these ideologies that seem plausible, that seem perfect in the eyes of many, but they're not sustainable. No. And what I worry about in America, people are like, we could never collapse. And the problem is they think that we're talking about some immediate downfall as if this is going to be some huge momentous moment. But in reality, it'll look more like Venezuela where there was just a slow decline over time that got worse and worse and worse until you couldn't recognize the country anymore. And I'm worried about this new inflation in America. I mean, this this seems like a very long-term problem that we're entering. And the problems that will come from the people that will suffer from inflation, I'm worried that that's going to be used similar to what was happening in Venezuela before socialism came 
the inflation and the suffering that's going to happen because of the bad policies right now is going to drive people to have even more hate for each other and even more division between the wealth, uh, the wealthy and then the, the working class and the middle class. And that will be used by those same people that already destroyed the economy to this extent to promote even more radical policies. And that's what I'm really concerned about. I would say that we are sort of on that path already. Yeah. Okay. Um, people think, like you say, that that it's going to be drastic from now we are here and then tomorrow we're going to be mm -hmm. down, you know, in this in that black hole. But um, when you see how the educational system has been worked through the years, how nowadays the mentality of the youth. Um, and even and even this ideology that the government is going to promise, you know, is supposed to protect you and give you absolutely everything, even with the cancellations of debts. Mm -hmm. That happened in Venezuela, too, with Carlos Andres Perez. He canceled out of debts and many... Interesting. Yes. And even people were happy, like, oh, my God. It, and it's not just education, but some other internal debts. As if, as if the money is going to be, you know, there forever. Mm -hmm. And it's just populist ideologies that just satisfy my immediate problems. And unfortunately, people get used to that. Yeah. They became, the Venezuelan government became a, a, a government that created these little problems, keep people more busy and busy and busy. They don't have more time to deal with what my future holds. I need to solve how I'm going to pay my gas, how I'm going to get food. Yeah. I, I was reading in the news yesterday, a story came out that economists, I think Washington, D.C. economists, were warning Americans to start saving an extra $5,100 for the next year to help pay for inflation. And so the more we see these huge numbers. I mean, a startling number of Americans do not even have $1,000 in their savings or to use for a rainy day. And so now we're being told by economists, oh, but by the I way, I know that those are your, your current situations, but keep an extra five grand uh, because of our bad policies. I worry about that. Now, I'm really curious about this. You just talked a little bit about the education system and young Americans, and I don't want this to be a, let's debunk all the lies that the left has <laughs> said about Venezuela, because we could make a whole video on that one. Um, when you talk about Venezuela these days, the left has successfully propagandized the whole situation, where now if you bring up Venezuela to a young person, they go, oh, there you go again, bringing up Venezuela right. like a classic conservative or right. classic anti-socialist person does. And it's because they've literally been trained now to laugh at the concept that the socialism being promoted in America is similar to Venezuela. Clearly, it's just going to be Nordic Europe. You know, it, mm -hmm. they have the same talking points, but the left has successfully made it. So the kids laugh now if you even bring up Venezuela. What do you think about that? And, and do you want to try and reach them on a personal level? Do you think it needs to be fixed in the education system where we aren't teaching about these countries enough? Or what are your general thoughts? Well, I would say socialists have not your best interest. I've never seen somebody who says, Be, bring people down, that it has anything to do or wants something good for you. And don't tell you, how can I bring you up? How can I improve you as an individual? to bring you up. So socialists don't want to have absolutely, they have not your best interest. There, I don't think there's any socialist country who really lives in this socialist, the true socialist idea, because they always have those high rank, even the politicians live, live much better than the people they govern. Yeah. And to me, it's telling them, no, because I don't want anybody to tell me how to dream. They don't know if my dream could be just, you know, being in the library or it could be being a businesswoman. Why do I have to have the government to tell me how my future should look like? And what happened if tomorrow I have the greatest invention? Like I tell the kids, like nowadays, what happens if tomorrow you, or in a year, you become and have this great invention? Now you're part of the bad people. 
who probably can become rich or can be successful. The problem with the, the idea this socialism is different than this socialism is that it, it, it colludes in the same thing, okay? It gives more power to the government. That's it. I don't care if you tell me it's in Europe, it's in Venezuela, and it's in Cuba. It all comes down to the same thing, and it's more power to the government. Today we know who is the president. If we keep going in this more power to the government, we don't know who's going to be there in five, ten years from now. Yeah. Like in Venezuela. I mean, Hugo Chavez was bad. Now you have Maduro, who's ten times, if not to say a hundred times worse. Yeah. But you gave them already the power to the government. You gave them more power and you rely everything to them. That's what I would tell them. Why would you? Would you trust the government to manage your finances? How can we not keep the government on check so they stop spending the way they do? You see? The more power they have, the worse it's going to be, whatever name you want to call it. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too. The Nordic European style, yes, they technically have market economies still, but they have huge government programs. And what often gets overlooked in why socialism is bad and the actual you know, economic socialism that we see in Venezuela, it's, it's more about control. It's like, yes, the quality of products might go down and the options of products might go down and the costs might go up. But at the end of the day, this is more about the government is now the only provider of really important things in your life. And they can take those things away if you refuse to comply. And so that same kind of danger also exists in Nordic Europe now because they're just taking a longer and slower route to that same concept of giving government massive control over their lives. Do you have any recollection of um, what it looked like in Venezuela when they started attacking private business? And from what I've heard, it was also very bureaucratic. It yeah. wasn't necessarily a violent thing where they would go in and say, get out right away. But they came up with all these bureaucratic rules similar to what we saw over the last three years in America mm -hmm. with all these shutdowns and stuff. And they would say, you're now in violation of X, Y, Z thing, and you've got to be out in a few days. We better not see you. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they also created this quote-unquote protection okay. to employees to the point that... Oh, protection. Almost, yeah, <laughs> to the point that it was almost impossible for you to fire an employee. Oh. But if you cannot... Mm -hmm. If you cannot even get um, income because everything is so bad and you still cannot even fire or even because they deserve to be fired. So the rules and regulations were not realistic or sustainable for any business. Yeah, well, I heard it was the same for property owners where people just stopped paying rent and the policies were in favor of those people that basically just began stealing the property and, and not leaving the homes. And so the business owners are paying for all the bills for the property and then getting attacked by the government if they dared to try and kick someone out who was just living there for free. And so it, this concept of having any order in society started to slip. Right. Very dangerous. It, but, you know, Often we talk only about the government. The government did this and the government did that. But at the end of the day, it's the same population. You see, it's the people who, they say, this satisfied me now. This is good for me today. But is it good for realistically? It's going to be good for my son. Is it going to be good? Is it good for the country? And generally it's not. And so I'll, you know, as you get older and as you start understanding a lot of things, um, I think Venezuelans didn't realize the power that they had. They just relied on power and the government. They literally give it away and never accepted the responsibility that came with that. The responsibility to say, yeah, it was us who continued to support these ideologies because of hate. So part of the problems comes with 
same society. And like I'm saying, it has nothing to do, not all of it has to do with education because Venezuela, even though Venezuela, many seen Venezuelans now on the street because it's terrible. The Venezuelan that we had, you know, back in the day, the, the good times of Venezuela, very well educated individuals too, mm -hmm. you see? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the same thing. Most of the people supporting socialism these days are educated white liberals that um, think they are providing social justice for other minorities. And to, to see these people where you're curious, you have access to all of this information and this is the choice that you make to try it again, an idea that leads to massive suffering. It, it is hard for me to understand, but I, I think it's a combination of good intentions or honestly, they, they really think they, they're they just better than the people who have tried it before and they think they could actually make it happen this time. You gotta I, wonder. I have my theory per se. Oh, you know, it's just a theory. It because this is a concept that I can never wrap my head it's around. It's just a theory, mm -hmm. okay? But I think socialism and socialists go around the world and it's just like a manipulator. They see what is your weak point, right? And they, they, they tackle you there in that area. I think in the United States, it's the same, the same product is sold differently. And one of the things I've seen in, in the American people, or us Americans, I'm an American too, yes, proud are. American, is that we are a generous society. Okay, so they don't tell you this is to bring necessarily the down, is to help. So they tackle, they sell socialism with the power that they know they can grab, which is, you know, everybody here wants to be a philanthropist. If you donate money, if you are doing, you know, you feel good. It's like, yes, this is what we are. So yes, do socialism. Because with socialism, we're really going to help more people. But what they don't tell you is that bringing everybody down is a, its main goal of socialism. Goal of socialism is it never brings everybody up. It's about bringing people down. And as they bring down people, they're going to be those few who stay way up there with a lot of resources, a lot of money, and they're going to be the ones who control. Yeah, and that's so that's what we see in Venezuela now. Oh. You left at a good time, or a luckier time than other people. Not yeah. lucky, you, you made the intentional mm -hmm. leave, I should say, and that was very smart on your part. Can you explain, let's talk about why you left and how you did that, and then what Venezuela looks like now, because it's very, very sad to see. Yeah, like I said, I have this amazing friend who constantly talk about Hugo Chavez in comparison with uh, socialism. Um, I guess it's part of luck and vision that I came to the United States and in a book fair, I found an athlete who went with me to the Olympic games uh, and she, she was a tennis player. And she told me the, how she got her documentation. So I went and went to the lawyer and I was, you know, I applied for a visa, an O visa. Uh, it's called an Extraordinary Ability Visa. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard to prove if you don't have the credentials. But you did. I mean, but you're an Olympic easy, athlete. It is easy to prove if you don't have the credential. How to I prove see. international medals, national medals. And, and okay. that was, for me, okay, here they are, right? And uh, so I, I had this discussion with my mom. My parents you know, thought I was, I was crazy. Like really? crazy, yeah. And what year was this? Oh my God, 2002. Okay, that's a hot time. <laughs> yes, 2002, that was four years after Hugo Chavez was on power. Uh, right after the big, huge turmoil with the oil industry too, during all that time. Um, and then I was Olympic hope for Athens 2004 back then. Uh, my last competition was in Brazil. Uh, the South American Games, I had won three gold medals out of four gold medals. So I was in a good, wow. you know, it's like when you are like there. Yeah. But then also in my mind was like, what can I do with a medal? Let's say hypothetically, I win a medal in Athens. How can I eat that? Yeah. Can you eat it? How can I, do I have to sell it? If Venezuela keeps going on this route? 
And back then I had a boyfriend who was living here and that made things a little bit easier, of course. But um, it was a very thoughtful, almost going against the current decision, leaving everything behind, my university, family, friends, school. Um, I, I foresaw that Venezuela was definitely not going on a good path. And, you know, I, I was young and I just wanted to live a life, a life in a free country, in a free society. But I always oversaw that this, this is it. Like, wow, these people have the life. You know, I want that too. <laughs> wow. And so what was it like? Were you trying to convince your family to come? Did they say, maybe you go settle and then we'll follow you? Or did you not know at all? No, it was like total disconnection. Disconnection yeah. completely. I, my point of view was totally different. Like I'm saying, everybody thought I was crazy. You were trying to say, this is going to get bad. Socialism yes, is like, going to be bad for Venezuela. I'm going to, it, they weren't listening to you? No, there was a, a story. Okay. And while my mom is there, <laughs> at, she took me to a psychologist. Oh. <laughs> she took me to a psychologist thinking that this woman could change my mind. Mm -hmm. And I did a write out about it. And, and in fact, she did not. She just told me, I'll never forget that. She said, okay, you're going to go. You're going to leave everything. But just remember that that's your decision. If things don't go your way, you are responsible for that decision. Okay. That's and a fair, fair point. And I hold that dearly. Mm -hmm. I never looked back and, and I left. I left. But, but like I'm saying, many people didn't believe that what's, what Venezuelan is today mm -hmm. was even possible. Wow. You come to America and you're young. Did you try and start up the same career that you were working on? Or what did you do when you got here? Well, when I got here, it was, you know, it's a completely cultural shock mm -hmm. in so many different ways. Um, maybe not so much in Miami, <laughs> but there's still some differences, some things to adjust mm -hmm. myself. Um, I never worked in Venezuela. I was just a, a student and full-time athlete. So that was something different to come here and then trying to work. I ended up working in a, in a gun shop for several years. I figured that... You know, that was my life. That's what I knew. That's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I started having, uh, working in a gun shop and it was great for sure. Yeah. Now, what was it like? Did you start hearing, like you get to America and you start becoming more aware of the politics here and you mm -hmm. find out, oh, there's people that advocate for gun control. There is still a leftist faction. I, I find it interesting because when we've talked to other people, maybe from communist China or the mm -hmm. USSR, they talk about how they got here and they're like, yeah, I'm in the West. And then they yeah. go, oh my gosh, there's, <laughs> there's people saying some crazy things right. here too. But at least there's, there's more of a dynamic between the right and the left and uh, in general, we're more central. But did, what were you thinking hearing for the first time leftists and liberals say the same dangerous ideas? Well, I didn't want to have anything to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought at the beginning, I was like, who are these people? Uh -huh. Like, why are they even here? Mm -hmm. You know, this is just insane. Uh, and so I immediately aligned with the conservatives, mm -hmm. uh, listening to these ideologies and me coming from there. I always thought that they were completely out of whack. Yeah. You know, um, I guess at the beginning, uh, my main concern is just the language. Mm -hmm. I remember, I'll never forget that. Uh, oh, did you speak English or not? If, no. Very, That's a challenge. very, very little. Mm -hmm. Very little spoke. But I listened to the Univision, I listened to the Hispanic TV shows mm -hmm. and the Hispanic news, and you, they, they kind of tend to go, I don't know why, on the left. Hmm. Yeah, ironically. And um, I, I was like, I just didn't get it. Uh, but I remember listening to Obama uh, talking that he didn't come from a, a spoon, how do you call it, like a silver spoon? A silver spoon, yeah. And that, I was like, that's it. I don't like that. Mm. I didn't like it. I mean, I didn't come from that. I mean, I, I, we come from a poor family too, but in my head was like, I don't care. 
What is if you're rich, poor? I want to hear what is that you're going to do for the country. What are your policies? I don't like that distinction. Let's hate, you know, the rich, the poor, because you are white, because you are. I just never like that. You know, Venezuela, most people don't know, Venezuela is a very diverse country. Yeah. From the 70s, because of that golden era, people from all over the world. I, in my small city, fairly small, not necessarily too small, but in, in my city, we had, I studied with people from Italians, you know, from people from all over the world, Mexicans, people from Europe, I mean, I don't know, I kind of have to make a list of people. China, my best friend, was born in China and immigrated to Venezuela when she was 13. Oh, wow. So I grew up with immigrants, and we never saw each other as you are less than me or you have less opportunities than me because I'm Venezuelan. We were all in the same field. You have to work as hard as I have to work. They didn't have more advantages than I did, and they didn't have more advantages than they did. If I didn't do my grades and, and they worked harder, they'll go up and have their degrees and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, politics in America has gotten very divisive, especially with race and with you know, physical features and identities and all these things. Are you concerned by that now, that we're becoming more... Uh, more divisive based on what you look like and we're hiring people for what you look like, we're hiring people for their status versus their, their merits and their experience? Perhaps this will answer your question. Yeah. I've never called myself a minority. Mm. Ever. I've never considered myself a minority. Never. I'm like, when people say, oh, you're a minority, I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. First of all, because of what I told you earlier, that Venezuela grew up, I grew up with immigrants and they worked so hard. And I never see them as less mm -hmm. than me. They were my, my classmates. They were people I saw as owners in the uh, grocery store or neighbors. They were not less than I was. I never saw them like that. So here in the United States, the connotation of minority or this group and that is like you're less. Like you, it's almost like I'm not intelligent enough. Like you think I'm not capable enough. Mm -hmm. No, you're wrong. I'm not that. I am capable enough. I am strong enough. So I'm not that minority that you think I am. Yeah. Now, what about, this is a good one. What do you think about that Latinx term that they keep using? <laughs> <laughs> well, it took me, like, for surprise in my class in psychology. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> no. I think, I think it's just, again trying to put norms, n names, trying to rearrange ideologies and philosophies on, and identities. Mm -hmm. I am not a Latin ex. Yo soy Latina. And that's what I am. I'm a Hispanic. I was born in, in Latin America. So it is just, again, trying to change identities. And I don't think that's uh, that's not good. And I don't think Latinos will let that go slide easily. <laughs> no, I, if, if you look at like the poll numbers on that, I can't believe they're still using that term because it, most humans look at it and go, what? Except for I think the, the white liberal uh, college educated group. <laughs> that's right. the only one that's like, this is yeah. a good idea. Um, so let's go back because, so you had this amazing life that you, you built up this career. You're a very promising future in Venezuela. You come here. How did you start to work from going from that gun shop because now you have I mean I follow you for the gun tips like right. you post all this great stuff online I know a lot of young girls too that I'm friends with them they don't even know mm -hmm. that we know each other in that way and they follow you for the same kind of advice because you have made yet again another successful career so how did you build that out and I know you have a beautiful family but how did you start that too well you know they always say that from hardship comes often mm -hmm. beautiful things so after the gun shop, I was married with that previous who used to be my boyfriend back then. Um, and then he left me. A week late, two weeks later, I lost my job. Wow. I had all the debt on my name. I didn't know what to do. I struggled, you know, understandably, I guess. <laughs> it took me a good five, six months to really get back on my feet and understand, again, 
stop waiting for that miracle that was going to take me out of my misery, per se. Mm -hmm. Understanding that I am the only one who's responsible for my past, my present, and my future. And one of the things that techniques I used to come to that realization because it seemed like I couldn't find it anywhere, right? I was waiting for this miracle to happen to get me out of this hole. And then I realized that the answer was within me. I thought, who Gabby the shooter, what Gabby the shooter would do to get out of this situation? And then I was like, well, if I was shooting and I had a bad shot, that bad shot stays in the past. I don't dwell for it. I don't cry for it. Do I think about if I'm going to win the competition? Do I think if I'm going to win or shoot such score? No, because that's in the future. That's irrelevant. Even if I do my best score, another athlete could shoot even better. Mm -hmm. What I need to focus on is my now and how to do the perfect shot. And that's when I said, OK, I laid out my plan. I crying. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And then I realized what I needed to do. But it was, I learned how easy it is to stay down there, stay down in that dark hole. It almost thinks it distracts you, you know? And um, I learned to get out of that hole. So that was the foundation for it. But then, even struggling, I finally found a, a part time job. And then I decided, okay, I wanted this part-time job so I could work in the afternoons as a firearms instructor and build my career as a firearms instructor. Okay. And back then, there were no many. And we're talking early 2000s, 2000, well, about 2008, 2009, something around that time. Uh, there were not that many female firearms instructors. And I remember some people asking me, so you're going to teach. You don't have any military or law enforcement background. But I used to say, well, I went to the Olympics. I think I can teach one or two things, right? And I focus on precision and enjoyment and, and also the psychological part of shooting. I've been always fascinated by it. Okay. And sure enough, okay, the opportunity about Top Shot. And when that opportunity about that Top Shot came in, I had to make an important decision because my only part-time job that was really holding me together and paying my bills and everything, mm -hmm. did not want it to give me the time to participate on Top Show. And they say, well, you either don't go there or quit. So I quit. And I played it all. So, you know, I learned at that point that I was such a rock bottom that a risk was just a game. And, and I had friends who, in a way, discouraged me to participate because I was season four. And before that season, all the women had been eliminated earlier in the competition. So many friends, friends, good friends, and with good faith. Yeah. I want to point it out. Yes, they did. They were saying, Gabby, if you get eliminated earlier, that's going to ruin your career as a farms instructor. What people are going to think and that. And... I thought, you know what? Nobody can take away that I went to the Olympic Games mm -hmm. or that I won certain medals or I have done what I've done in my career. I'm just going to go for it. So when people see me today, you know, many have to understand that today is not just who I am right now. I am the fruit of so many years, so many, de many decisions that not all of them were perfect, but many of them carry a purpose. And the purpose was self-trust, trust, believing that there's a possibility, there's a future. Wow. And so how did Top Shot go? Well, it went great. I mean, I, I, I even thought, even I said, if any, if I go to Top Shot and let's say I get eliminated on the first episode, who else, how I can say in my life that let me put it this way. I thought, at least I can say that I did something that not many in the world can say they did. I ended up being one of the women, or the only woman, who 
uh, lasted the longest in the competition and reached the highest portion of the competition. So that was very, you know, exciting. Even though my elimination was hard, it was on a 1500 yard shot. Wow. And so that was not an easy shot. There was knowledge I didn't have, uh, but nonetheless, it was a fascinating, not only experience, but a personal growth uh, experience in so many different ways. Um, and, and also, you know, after that, hearing people saying, oh my God, my wife got into shooting because she saw you on really? Top Shot. My daughter got into shooting. You know, I'm a petite woman. And, yeah. and many women, and many women, not necessarily that they were petite, but they thought, oh man, she can do it. I can do it. So to me, there was at least something that I gave back, even without knowing. <laughs> wow, I love that. And so did any opportunities come from that? Is that what launched you even further? Because you're quite well known now. Right. So of course, you know, now that I was on top, top chat was broadcast worldwide. I have people from that write me from Italy, from Europe, from Australia, from South America, um, plus the people I knew as an Olympic shooter in Europe, in South America, in Central America. So I guess Top Shot also gave me a open door for people to know, in the United States particularly, to know who I am. And you know, the woman who I am too, because when I was on the show, it was not only about, to me, it was not only about shooting and having this persona, you know, I'm on camera and let me act in a certain way. No, it's just who I am and what I love. Mm -hmm. Shooting is what I do because I've done it for so many years and I love it and give the other uh, people an opportunity to see who I am. Yeah. Okay. So, so what do you do now? And ha has that changed at all since that time or uh, what are your goals now? Well, like I, I am now a full-time student college student, um, studying psychology. I want to do sports psychology, that's my goal, and possibly work within the military line, something like that. But I always had my vision in space programs. I love science, I love space. And so I think that it's gonna be a good goal for me. Um, and what I do now, I also compete I have my, I'm sponsored. Um, I don't know if I can say my sponsor. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I am sponsored by Welfare Arms. I'm sponsored by Primary Arms, our great supporters. Not only of what I do as a competitor, but as a representation as a whole. Very nice. Because. I like that. And, and I love that to show people because we, I go to the range and I shoot mm -hmm. and people see me with the firearms and all that stuff, but I'm a person Two, when I'm not off the range, I'm a mother, I'm an army wife, um, you know, I love to paint, I love to cook. Um, I go full-time student because I realize, and you probably have noticed this since the last time we talked, my communication skills have improved tremendously because I can actually write papers. Not because I couldn't do that in, before, but I could only do it in Spanish. Oh, wow, okay, that's I a never, huge change. I never studied uh, any formal English education in the United States. And I went from wow. graduating high school in Venezuela to flat out going to university. Like, what is this grammar, English grammar? You know, but that's part of life. Mm -hmm. I do believe that's part of life. And I have one thing I want to say too. Yeah. I do believe one of also the biggest, one of the problems that we have in America is that academia is being hijacked by one ideology. It seems like, the, like even in psychology, it seems like everything is just left-leaning. There's not that balance. I do believe everything has to be a balance. Mm. So I, I always tell my husband, I, I'm pushing hard to be one of the best on, on school too, because that's my contribution to this country too. Wow, that's what we need too, is, is more people present instead of abandoning it. We do, we do. Wow. I know that there's always this talk about, yeah, we can have just this school, like, a, how do you call it, trade schools? So yeah, vocational. Vocational schools, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is to go and get a degree and get a PhD, but if you can do it, because 
I do believe we need it. And I'm gonna tell you why. And everybody can see it. You know, you can be very successful businessman, and you don't have to have that title to be successful. But those who make the laws more likely are gonna listen to the, teach, the, the teacher, the professor of the university, YXC, and the scholars from to make their laws, mm -hmm. to align their agendas. So we need also these conservatives, these minds that are also in academia that can contribute to balance. I'm not saying that we are perfect. Yeah. I don't want to say that my views and my ideas are 100%. No, it's, that would be crazy to think like this. We need to have a balance. I love that. And I like that it's solutions oriented. Um, it's easy to complain and it's easy to tell people socialism is very bad, don't do it. But um, there's so many layers to improving the state of America. Do you have any other solutions? Like as a, as a closing message, I mean, there's confused Americans out there. I think part of the problem is the education system failed them, yes, and so they, they just truly don't understand and they haven't gotten the basic information that they deserve. So it's really an injustice there. They, they deserve better, I think, for these young Americans. But there's also some evil people out there that really do see the impact of socialism and say, let's try it one more time. I think we could do it better this <laughs> right. time. So there's different patches of groups out there. What are your message to, messages to them and, and what do you think can be done in a positive way? Let's close on a positive note. <laughs> right. Well, I think the first thing I, I would tell, especially young Americans, mm -hmm. that this is the best country in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Love it. But most importantly, you have to be open, open-minded to gather all the information from all sources. Mm -hmm. And understand that this is not, it should not be a one time fix that fix my problem right now. That we have to have a solution for everybody to thrive instead of a solution to bring people down. Mm -hmm. I think that more, the more you look out, the more you look outside, you more, and especially after the pandemic, and you see Florida open. Well, other countries were in completely, well, even New York and California, and lockdowns, you see that here in the United States, there is true freedom. And that freedom is priceless. And that's a freedom that we have to always, always, always dear and protect. And I'm gonna close with one thing. I hear from the left and the right, they'll talk about democracy. Democracy, we're fighting for democracy. Hugo Chavez said that we had a democracy too. So to me, the word democracy is just a word. What is that democracy founded on is what matters. What is underneath that? How many freedoms do you have? How much control the people do have? That's what a real democracy, you can find and define a real democracy. Wow, well, Gabby, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. And I know a lot of people who follow you just love what you put out there in the world. It's very positive. It's informative. We appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for taking time out of your very busy thank schedule you. to join us. Thanks. Hey guys, it's Morgan. Before we head out, I just want to say thank you for watching The Freedom Records. And thank you so much to American Journey Experience for letting us film here in Dallas, Texas at their vault. You guys, this place is filled with world and American history artifacts. It's fascinating to learn the details of the objects that are right behind us on set. So thank you to American Journey Experience for letting us film here. And actually, you guys can come here yourself. So go to the link in our bio to learn how you can do that and how you can get connected to this great place. Thank you.